Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the CPR, EBRD, and Economics of Transition uh, webinar series on the economics of industrial policy. Uh, my name is Javad Aktoy. I'm a principal economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And today we have Christian Wolf and Martin Kutz from uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Um, so before I give the floor to Christian, let me tell you the rules of the um, uh, game. So Christian will have about 40 minutes uninterrupted. And then we will have at the end about 20, uh, 15, 20 minutes for Q&A session. For the questions during Christian presentation, please use the chat box. And we have Geronimo Carvalho, one of the co-authors of the paper, uh, uh, online as well. And Geronimo will be answering the questions. And Christian will present the, the paper uh, called uh, Information and Multinational Produ uh, Production. What is the impact of investment uh, promotion? Christian, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ivan. And also, Beata, for, for the opportunity to share with you this uh, joint work with uh, Geronimo and with Ignacio, who is at the IDB2. Uh, as you might see, the title of the presentation has slightly changed. We, we will talk today about what we believe can be considered a soft industrial policy in the sense that it's a widely used policy that uh, doesn't distort the price system and has been widely used in all countries around the world. And that policy is investment promotion. We will talk about what's the impact of this policy on the multinational production. So, uh, what do we care about that? You know that multinational production is a very clear feature in current global economic landscape. Just to give you two uh, figures, sales from foreign affiliates amount to approximately 40% of global GDP, and there are 40% larger than war rate. And in particular, the extensive margin of multinational production uh, account for a large share of the variation of this production across countries. Uh, just to be even more precise, there is a very nice paper by Natalia Ramondo and colleagues where they show that two thirds of the increase in bilateral multinational flows can be traced back to an increase in the number of affiliates and only one third can be attributed to larger sales per affiliate. And this is clearly different from what we know from international trade where the intensive margin played a dominant role. From a policy point of view, what we care about is the fact that the level and the patterns of the multinational production can be influenced by trade costs. And this is particularly the case with information barriers. You know that when firms, we are not entrepreneurs, but you can imagine that we want to do business overseas, we need to gather a lot of information. We need to understand how the business conditions are, what are the relevant regulations, what are the suppliers, who could be the potential buyers, how is the process to export and import goods in the countries we are interested in? So there is a huge information need when we need to take the decision. And information in these specific regards, it's very scarce and typically it's very dispersed. And this is particularly the case for destinations that are far away or less popular. We might know how things work in Germany, but we might not know how things work in Costa Rica, for example, the country we look at in this paper. And just to give you an idea, each of these aspects we need information on typically require specific study. So on setup is, is a study which is specific for the country, specific for the topic. And each of these studies, for example, uh, I, I want to know what other international firms in the country, uh, what kind of opinion those firms have in, in particular uh, aspects of the business climate. That survey can cost between $5,000 and $10,000, each of them. So that amounts a lot of money when you need to gather that kind of information for several aspects for several countries in order to take a decision. So information barriers can be considered a major determinant of the geography of multinational production in general mm -hmm. and the extensive margin of that production in particular. And, and that has implications. As a result of information incompleteness, multinational firms may end up considering only a small range of potential locations and disregard several others that could be equally convenient. And, and believe me, I think this is very relevant in the, in the current uh, stage of the world, where there are a lot of discussions about uh, reshaping of the global value change. We need to, countries may need to uh, become more visible. They, they, 
so the, the policy we're talking about today, investment promotion, I like to call it, is the art of making visible what is invisible. So it's making your country visible for the investors. And if you don't do that, you might remain unseen. And also from, um, from, from the literature, from the economic literature, academic literature, we know that these information barriers can be very important. There is evidence showing, for example, that six, uh, countries that share common language have 60%, 65% more affiliate than counterparts that don't share a common language. So information barriers are very important. Now, what's the policy response to these trade costs, which different from tariff are not created by governments? So virtually all countries around the world have established dedicated organizations that are called investment promotion agents. And the number of these agencies has substantially increased in recent decades. These figures you have in the slide come from a survey that we conducted together with the OECD, in particular with my colleague Monika Steirovska from the investment division, uh, where we survey more than 50 investment promotion agencies. And you can see there that there is a huge increase in recent decades in the number of these specialized organizations, uh, both in OECD countries, which are colored in black, and in Latin American and Caribbean countries, which are colored in red. So what these guys do? Investment promotion uh, agencies carry out activities that have as, as a goal attract multinational firms, and the way they do it is they try to reduce information barriers. And, and there are a number of papers to which uh, Beata has contributed a lot, and, and she has one of the pioneer papers uh, in this uh, literature, as we will see later on. So what's investment promotion about? Because every, everybody could have different views about that, or preconcepts. So let's make sure that we're all in the same page uh, about what we'll talk today about. So investment promotion here is about reducing information frictions. We are not talking about subsidies here, uh, like for example, free trade zones. That could be a different policy, but that policy clearly distorts the prices. Yeah, so this is a hard industrial policy. Here we are talking about the soft industrial policy, which is about information service. So there are main four, four main components, and these are the followings that we have here. So national investment, national image building. So the idea is to tell investors look, my country is a good place to do business. The second one is investment generation, where, whereby the agencies identify and approach potential investors and try to combine them about the, uh, the, the opportunities that are available in their own countries. Servicing, which is providing assistance to investors in analyzing business opportunities, in obtaining permits, in, in disseminating information on regulation, on av unavailable incentives and supporting compliance and access to, to these incentives and investment aftercare. And finally, it's an important role, which is policy advocacy, is gather information from the private sector about the inputs that are required to perform better the activities in the country and coordinate with the other parts of the public sector to deliver these required inputs to improve the performance of the, of the firms. So these are the, the four main pillars which is important, that, and that comes out from, from our survey to these 50 agencies, three quarters of the budget and the personnel of the agencies are typically allocated on average to investment generation and investment facilitation. So it's about bringing investors and providing them with services. Which is clear here is that they carry out a number of activities, so they have a different number of instruments to support firms. And, and these numbers, I mean, this is a very disaggregated classification. You can then group them in different ways, but basically you can have more than 50 type of activities that these agencies carry out to support firms, to provide firms with assistance in order to attract them to their territories. Now, what do we do in this paper? So we try to assess um, whether and how investment promotion affects multinational firms' location decisions. And, and therefore the spatial pattern of multinational production, in particular the extensive margin. So we address three main questions. So what's the, the impact of investment promotion on the likelihood that the multinational firms establish a first and a subsequent affiliate in the, in the country we're interested in, and uh, therefore on the spatial pattern of multinational production? Does the specific combination of policy instruments matter? Uh, and to what extent the effect of investment promotion are heterogeneous? 
across farms that can be from different home countries and that can operate in different states. In answering these questions, we apply a difference in difference and in instrumental variable strategies to identify this effect. And, and we focus on one particular country, which is Costa Rica. And in one particular agency, the National Investment Promotion Agency of Costa Rica, which is India. And we try to see how these interventions affect the multinational firms' location decisions. We use a unique database that combines data on the distribution of multinational firm foreign affiliates across all countries that includes information on the main sector of activity and year of establishment and data on this on the specific assistance Cinde provides to these firms over time so we can observe firm level data on both location decisions and investment promotion assistance status. Just in case you, you need to have to run to another meeting, and uh, that's typically the case when we are home because everybody has plenty of meetings or, or, or you have some familiar commitments, let me tell you the end of the movie. What we find is that the investment promotion has been actually effective in attracting multinational firms to Costa Rica, and support from Cindy has a positive and significant effect on the probability that those multinational firms establish a first affiliate in the country. This estimated impact is largest when the firms are assisted with services consisting in gathering information on local business conditions. The estimated effects are larger on multinational firms from home countries subject to more severe information barriers. And uh, in contrast, since this assistance does not seem to generally affect the established multinational firms' reinvestment decisions. So there is an impact on the extensive margins of the first affiliate, not so clear impact on subsequent establishment of affiliates. So what we could see some way as some kind of in intensive margin. It's an extensive margin, which is also an intensive margin. If we take these two results together, they will suggest that investment promotion might seem to operate by reducing information related, location specific, fixed cost associated with starting new business. We contribute to two main strands of the literature. The first one is a growing number of papers that have examined the patterns, determinants, and implications of multinational production. And, and I don't want to, I, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of people here, but this is just to give an example, um, a, number, a few examples. So there are a number of papers in recent years looking at the determinants of multinational production and the patterns of determinants. And we complement this paper by incorporating explicit policy angle into the analysis. We assess the role of investment promotion, which is a widely used in, uh, policy, as, as we saw, the times at lowering an important source of trade costs, which are information barriers, in shaping the geography of this multinational production. And second, there is a number of papers that present evidence on the impact of investment promotion, primarily from a, what we could call a macro perspective. Macro perspective essentially would be macro macro in the sense that we are working with the dependent variable at sector level or country level or country sector level. And uh, especially in all the papers I will refer to now, uh, on the policy side. On the policy side, we measure investment promotion as uh, the presence of an office in, in a particular host country, uh, as, as, as um, some policy apply at the country sector level. What we learn from these papers, and, and there are a few examples there on, from this literature to which I, I referred to before, the ATA has contributed significantly, has by produced the, the pioneer papers, is that uh, targeted promotional efforts have been effective, had led to higher FDI inputs, inflows to developing countries, essentially from the US. Um, and, and that's particularly the case for priority sector. Priority sector have received 150% more FDI after being targeted. So that means that these are the sectors the agencies are interested in and to which they both their uh, the stronger promotional efforts. Uh, there is a recent paper also from a colleague from um, LSE who looks at um, regional level investment promotion and he, he and his colleagues find that less developed uh, European regions are more likely to receive at all FDI inflows or more inflows if they are already receiving in the sectors that are targeted by their respective IPAs. And, and also how you do investment promotion matters. 
uh, Beata and, and, and Torpin Harden have this very interesting paper where they show that IPAs handle investor increase, uh, those that are handling investment investors increase in a more professional manner and have better, higher, better websites, higher quality websites are able to attract more API. So how we contribute to this literature? We, we try to answer uh, two questions. So one is about identification, are effects for real? So unlike studies based on aggregate data, we can observe all four possible combination of policy status and outcomes. So we know firms that are assisted and located and don't locate it. We know also which firms weren't assisted and located and didn't locate. So we know the four groups. From that, we can control for time varying country sector characteristics that when you work with, for, for example, with country sector year information, you cannot control for but that that's precisely the dimension across the data variants. So here we can do that, we can control for that, and we therefore can control for unobserved factors that might be correlated with investment, might be also potentially correlated with uh, promotions through fixed effect combined with and also an ID strategy. Second is the channel. So when we talk about FDI promotion and multinational production, a key question is what are the channels? So our firm level data on both location decisions and policy allow us to properly examine whether and particularly how investment promotion influence multinational production, either through the extensive or the intensive margin. And given that the importance of information friction is likely to differ across margins, can be uh, probably stronger on the extensive margin. So information barriers are more relevant on the extensive margin. We can see whether the impacts we observe in these two different margins are consistent with a mechanism associated with the reduction of information. So to, to be even more precise, if the information barriers are larger on the extensive margin, we should expect that the investment promotion has a larger, larger impact on that margin. On the extensive margin, we will define as the establishment of a first affiliate in the, in the country. That will also help, will support the identification. And finally, um, and, and this is also very relevant, what are the most effective instruments? What are the most effective combination of instruments? That is provision of information, is assistance with administrative procedures. And we, so to that, to answer that question, we present evidence on the extensive and the intensive margin of investment promotion the number of supported firms, uh, the, the intensity of the support, and, and very importantly, the effect of different type of instruments. And this provides us with a different angle from which we can assess whether the effects are consistent with this information reduction, information barrier reduction mechanism. We should expect that services that are more tightly related to the provision of information will have a largest, the largest impact. And, and that, that also helps to identification. And we also explore potential heterogeneities uh, across uh, other dimensions and, and look whether this is consistent with this story related to information. So let, let me go through the details now. This is the big picture. So let me tell you more precisely what kind of data uh, did we gather. First, we have data on multinational production. So here is, is about the relationship between multinational production and investment promotion. Let's start with multinational production. We gather uh, firm level data on both, for the first time to our knowledge, location decision of multinational firms and investment promotion for a country, which is Costa Rica, and for a long period of time. Let me be more precise. On uh, multinational production, we have data from two sources. One is a work base from, uh, by um, Dana Bradstreet that provides us with data on the home country, year of establishment, and sector of activity for all multinational firms that are included in that data, and data on the host country, year of establishment, sector of activity of each of their affiliates. This database is complemented with a database from Costa Rica, from the IPA uh, CINDE, that inform us the, also the date, um, date um, the starting year, the sector of activity of all firms and affiliates present in the country, and also the regime under which they operate, whether they are in the regular customs territory or they are operating under the free trade zone. 
which is, as I mentioned, a different kind of industrial policy and we should control for that. The second piece, the second component, the second main component of our database is the assistance to firms by the agency. So we gather information for all of his assist multinational firms assisted by the agency over the period 2000-2016 on an annual basis. We know exactly what's the kind of the nature of the service, whether well, the service was initiated by the agency or the firm, the specific type of service, the associated cost by firm and year. So we know, we know exactly the, how much the service cost to the agency for each firm for each year, and, and that's essentially related to the labor cost, so the, 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 the amount of time devoted to the, to the officials times the, the, their respective compensations. And, and we know also uh, which sectors were prioritized, and we know also that the agency has targeted firms, and we know which are those over time. So let me, a few words about Cinde, because the, we are talking about an agency uh, that is well-established and, and you probably don't know how these agencies, um, how they look like. Uh, in the case of Cinde, we are talking about an agency that was established in 82, it has a unique mandate, it's only investment promotion. You know that there might be agencies that perform several things, like for example, expert promotion, innovation promotion. Well, seeing that the only thing that does is investment promotion, is headquartered in the capital of the country, San Jose, has one single overseas office, which is in the US here in, in New York City. Has a budget of about $5 million, almost 50 employees, most of whom have previous experience in the private sector and in particular in multinational firms, and most of them speak a foreign language. I can testify that. I have talked to several of the colleagues working there, so that's exactly the case. Uh, they, uh, as the, the median agency in, in, the, in the survey I referred to before, three quarters of the resources are allocated to investment generation and investment facilitation. They carry out multiple promotional activities and has the agency has private sector that have slightly changed over some period, and they prioritize large, non-established multinational firms. And that's key for our identification strategy. They clearly reply to our survey saying, we prioritize large multinational firms. That's our target. So just to provide you with a snapshot of the data, this is the evolution of the number of multinational firms present in Costa Rica that increased from almost 200 to more than 450. We uh, current in 2016, there were more than 600 affiliates of these uh, five, uh, 465 multinational firms. They are from almost 50 origin countries and they operate in more than 140 sectors. And, and what you have in the last column to the right is the number of assisted firms uh, that, that has increased over time and it's around 150 in, in, in recent years. So here you have the evolution of the uh, number of multinational firms located in Costa Rica. Uh, that's the high of the bar. And you have in red those firms that established an affiliate for the first time in the country that were supported by the uh, investment promotion agencies in the, in the respective year. So basically what you see is that uh, we are not claiming identification here, it's just to make sure it's a very descriptive graph, which tells you is that the, the increase, there, there has been an increase, and there seems to be some role of the agency. That's kind of the graph that the, the agencies look like to have, because it's, it's very clear that there is a contribution if you in, subtract the red share the red part of the bar, you will see that the increase in the number of firms will have, it would have been significantly small. We are not claiming attribution here, just a graph. So what the agency did, what the firms did. So to, to answer the question whether the, the agency had a role in that particular, had actually a role, we need to go to a more formal analysis. And this is exactly what we do. Uh, we, we basically estimate the following baseline general empirical model, which is a linear probability model, due to the huge number of fixed effects, as you will see here. So essentially, we are linking a variable, which is IE, 
which is a binary indicator of establishment of multinational firm in the home country, in the host country, is either a first affiliate or a subsequent affiliate. The first affiliate is what we call first establishment. The subsequent affiliates is what we call reinvestment. It's a very particular definition of reinvestment because we are, it's, it's a definition on the extensive margin. It's adding a new affiliate. We are not talking about here uh, uh, about number of employees, sales. We love to see that. Unfortunately, we don't have the data for all these firms for all these years. So we just look at the extensive margin. <clears throat> and but what is important is that this extensive margin, as we discussed before, accounts for a large share of the bilateral variation in multinational production flows. And so this is the dependent variable. The main explanatory variable is a binary indicator, IIPA, which um, captures the investment promotion assistance status of the multinational firm. Takes the value of one, uh, in particular when it's T, were when the multinational firm was assisted by the investment promotion agency SINDE in that particular ERT and zero otherwise. And then we have a number of controls, time varying firm level control, that are defined based on the existing literature. So a huge number of controls. We are including controls for the total number of affiliates worldwide of the firm, the total number of countries in which the multinational firm is present, the total number of sectors in which the multinational firm operates in the world across their affiliates. And we have, uh, given the literature, a number of controls related to the network of affiliates. You know that depending on where your affiliates are located, you might end up uh, opening an affiliate in particular countries and not in others. So we have, for example, uh, whether you have uh, an affiliate in a neighboring country, whether you have an, an affiliate in a country where the multinational firm, uh, the, the host country and the home country uh, have a multilateral um, trade agreement and in bilateral investment agreement or a double taxation treaty, or where they are present in the region as a whole, not only in the neighboring country, but in other, for example, in the case of Costa Rica, Latin American countries, or countries in, in countries that are similar in terms of development. Then we have firm fixed effect that are essentially given a firm home country sector fixed effect. And then we have home country sector year fixed effect. That's essentially what I referred to in, in, in the previous slides. We are able to control for this country sector uh, year variation that uh, could be correlated with investment promotion and, and location of multinational. So that's essentially our baseline estimation in the, in the difference in difference approach. And we will always cluster standard errors by a firm for, infer, uh, for inference purposes. We have a huge number of fixed effects, but, and, and, and you know, in, in, this, in this kind of uh, estimations, people like to have a lot of fixed effects, or people say, oh, you are killing the variation, you, you should have less fixed effects. So you will see we have all possible combination of fixed effects. Uh, but on top of the fixed effect, you can always claim, well, the issue remains that support might be endogenous to multinational firms' location. And, and that's precisely because of self-selection. Firms might go to the agency because they are already interested and they already decided to invest in the country. So we, we take advantage of this institutional information gathered through the survey according to which the agency prioritize large firms to see where we can use a particular instrument. So if you see the survey, the agency says, we prioritize large firms. What we did is we approach the agency and we ask them, so what do you mean by a large firm? What's a large firm for you? And they told us, well, oh, basically we, that's Fortune 1000. Uh, and then what we did essentially is we download all the Fortune 1000 lists for all the sample period, and we use them as an instrument for the assistance. And we also, uh, as an alternative, we also use uh, the whole list of target large firms by Finde from different years, and you will see why we are using this particular CAT, time CATS. So <clears throat> our first stage equation is therefore as follows. We will be estimating the, uh, the impact of um, the uh, indicator, the, uh, the Fortune 1000, on the likelihood that the firm is assisted by multinational, by the National Investment Promotion Agency has seen that, and when we have the, the, the controls that we have uh, before. 
you can you, you might concern about number of things here um, let me tell you first show you one thing and then we discuss first is you you see here the number of firms assisted by the agency in how, how it evolved over time and you see that there, there is this in different red colors you have the share that that are that correspond to firms that either belong to the fortune thousand or to the uh, to the list the own list of the agency and you can see here that they um, there have been an increase a significantly increase in in different time periods so we use the 2006 cut for the fortune thousand and 2011 and, and and if you see these are the largest largest increase when you compute it the largest increase in the in the previous and post periods in in the use of these um, indicators. You might be concerned about the exclusion restriction here, because you might say, well, okay, I mean, if a firm enters the the Fortune 1000, well, it will invest anyways, anywhere. Yeah, that that's a probably a typical concern you might have. First thing you have we need to take into account is that. Uh, this is a conditional variation. We are, as you saw, we are including a huge number of fixed effects. We're including a lot of performance measures. <clears throat> Once you do that, and you focus on countries, and you say you estimate reduced form, and you focus on countries that are not tax haven, uh, according to literature, and you focus on countries that are similar in terms of site to Costa Rica, meaning below 100 billion US dollars GD, annual GDP, what you see is that in more than 90% of the cases, the Fortune 1000 indicator doesn't have any impact. So there is no direct relationship whatsoever between being in the, 4, 000, the Fortune 1000 list and investing in a particular country with this characteristic, not being a tax haven, being a relatively small country. There are a few exceptions here. One is Trinidad Tobago, uh, Trinidad Tobago, if you see the survey we conducted, they say, well, we focus on firms that have well-known brands. And that's precisely what Fortune 1000 does, gives you a brand. Yeah, so it makes you known around the world. And then we have two uh, countries, Slovakia and Serbia. We don't know much about them. But, and then we have Costa Rica. And Costa Rica, uh, for us, it should work because it's reduced form, should have an impact. But we are including here assisted firms. So basically, when we remove assisted firms, there is no impact whatsoever of being in Fortune 1000 and establishing um, an affiliate in Costa Rica. So it's only significant if we include assisted firms uh, within the group. Uh, Christian, you have five minutes left, by the way. Sure. Okay. So uh, then we look at the heterogeneous effects. So basically, we let's go through the results. Uh, we have the first uh, the difference in difference estimation, and here what we see clearly is that there is a positive, and we we are going from no fixed effect at all, no controls, nothing, to a, a specification that is estimated in difference, the, the one on the on the right, the, the fifth column, with estimated in difference, and even with firm fixed effect. So. Uh, our baseline specification is mark identified in red, and what we see there is that there is a positive and significant impact of the assistance on the first establishment, but no impact at all on the establishment of a subsequent affiliates. Yeah, so the impact is about uh, 11 percentage points uh, on first establishment. Then we go through a number of uh, thing controls. For example, we include lag assistance status. Here we, we work with the full available sample, and then we restrict the sample to uh, observations that are common across all these estimations, and we always find that the impact is on the, on the, on the contemporaneous, not with the last. Then what we did is we tried with different um, ID estimates, so one in one we use the Fortune 1000 list, that's the first column, then we use the, in the second column, the Cinder list, and then in the third and fourth column, we use different combination of both. Let's focus on the first one. Uh, what, what we can see there is that uh, we also find a positive and significant impact of the investment promotion assistance by uh, Cinde. Uh, the statistics is about 10, and, and the Hansen statistics um, is, because we are not using one, we have different num number of labs of, of the list, uh, it's is not significant. 
Uh, and the, again, there is no positive impact at all on, on, on reinvestment. So let's focus on the 14,000. Um, and the question you may have, the, the, the next question you have is, okay, but the impact on OLS is significantly smaller than on what you get in, in the ID estimation. And what should be that the case? So let me show you one graph. Well, you have different, different estimation here. What you have here is, uh, at the top is full sample. So what we have is the OLS is significantly smaller than the IV. Now, when, when, when you target, when you target, and that's about targeting, you provide higher assistance intensity. So you provide more services to the firm. What happens when we restrict the sample to firms that have similar intensity in, in the assistance. So the difference shrinks. What, and, and then what the um, Sinde does is to focus on large firms. So what happened when we consider similarly large firms in terms of the number of affiliates, in terms of the number of countries that are present, in terms of the number of sectors they operate with, the difference reduces further. And we, you, when, when you combine both of them, when, when you're estimating the OLS and the IV on a sample of firms that are similarly large and that receive the same intensity of assistance, the difference is uh, less than 50%. And you can see that the, uh, the confidence interval of the OLS, it's the, the upper part is coincides virtually with the, with the IV estimate. So what we are capturing here essentially is what you are prioritizing and how you prioritize them. We are prioritizing large firms and you, well, by doing that, you are providing more service. Once you account for that, basically there is no significant difference between the OLS and the IB estimate. Another thing we do is we, uh, we, look, we go for, through a different way, uh, way. We see whether the impact uh, is different depending on who initiated the contact. If you if the firm initiated the content, you might be more concerned that they, uh, they already decided to invest in the country. And, and, and that's the case. It's largest on, on the reactive uh, assistance. But still, proactive assistance, that means assistance initiated by the agency, are still positive and significant and very similar to our baseline estimate. Again, nothing on reinvestment. Uh, here, we also conduct a, a sort of a, a series of placebos uh, moving the, um, the assistant uh, to the future and we only see a positive and significant impact on the on the contemporaneous uh, assistant and uh, and finally as, as I told you uh, we have information on on the different services the different services can be uh, mainly grouped in three categories information services, procedural services, and human capital services. So uh, services to identify and, and recruit personnel. What you see in here is that the largest impact correspond precisely to information services. So the impact is largest there and what you see on the bottom of the table, which is the associated labor cost of those services, these are the, the ones with the smaller cost. So information services have the largest impact and the lowest cost. That tells you something about how you should organize your activities to uh, support the, um, the attraction of multinational firms. And just to conclude on time, uh, investment promotion policies, as we saw, are um, one, one last word. We also explore the the impact on different uh, firms from different origin countries. And the impact is larger on countries for which the information barriers are larger. Like for example, countries that don't speak a common language with Costa Rica, countries that don't share a, a common border with Costa Rica, countries that have uh, less than the median stock of Costa Rican migrants in their territory. So for, for these countries where information uh, barriers are likely to be larger, the impact of investment promotion is accordingly larger. So just to conclude, investment promotion policies are uh, ubiquitous. Uh, little is known on whether and so to what extent, and especially how investment promotion affect multinational firms location decisions. We try to close this gap in the literature. We provide evidence on the effects of 
investment promotion and, and the channels and mechanisms for the first time using specific data, film level specific data on both, and, and, and that's the innovation, on, on policy status and location decisions. And our results reveal that investment promotion has had a positive and significant impact on the probability that the multinational firm establish a first affiliate in the host country. And, and again, it's first affiliates. So it's, it's the clear definition of the extensive margin is when the firm for the first time invest in the country. So where information barriers are likely to be largest. <clears throat> The information, uh, the reduction of information frictions through the provision of relevant specific information appears to be the main mechanism through which IPA affect multinational firm location decisions. So these information barriers seem to be reduced essentially when you provide specific information services, as you would expect. And, and the results are robust to a number of controls. And, and believe me, we have thousands of tables in the paper, some not even in the appendix, uh, but. We try to address endogeneity concerns through an instrumental variable approach, and we conduct these placebos and event studies and so on. We use alternative specifications. We consider only firms that were assisted by the agency or for which the assistant was initiated by the agency itself. We try to control for all other IPA support. In one of the robustness state checks, we use the country with which Costa Rica compete the most, which is uh, Mexico, and we control for assistance by the Mexican Investment Promotion Agency, and we also take into account other investment promotion, uh, other investment promotion policies in the country, mainly in the case of Costa Rica free trade zones. Basically, what we do is we remove all the firms uh, located in in those zones, and we still find that the investment promotion assistance by Cinde has a positive and significant impact on the probability that the multinational firm not present in Costa Rica establishes its first affiliate. Um, and with that, I, I conclude and thank you very much for your attention and being here in these challenging times. Uh, thanks, Christian, you just finished on time. Uh, so I think uh, we have about 15 minutes for uh, questions. Uh, so other participants, if they could use raise the hand option, I will unmute their mic and they can ask uh, their questions directly to uh, Christian. Christina Orban, have a, uh, she has a question. Christina, you can ask. That was a um, very interesting talk. Uh, thanks for that. So I was wondering whether you know anything about how this information friction channel interacts with um, text treatment of these different multinationals. So specifically, I was wondering whether um, you could say something about how the text treatment sorry, the tax status is determined. Is that also negotiated between the government, specifically to the firm um, and the firm itself? And whether you think that um, this information channel might be correlated at all uh, with, uh, with tax treatment? And maybe you're already controlling for this in one of your controls. I know there are a bunch of controls, so you might not have had the time to, to show that to us, but that was my question, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, yes, I mean, the, um, so two, 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 two answers to that question, which is, I think, very relevant. First, uh, we have in the estimation a country sector year fixed effects. That means uh, since we are working with a one home, a host country, Costa Rica, and we have different origin countries, basically, if there is a tax treaty, a trade agreement, or bilateral investment treaty between countries, this is automatically controlled for. Uh, there might be, though, different effects of, and, and that's the second part of your question, where well, there might be an interaction between the information services and the existence of those treaties. Uh, we, we did that. Uh, so in, in, in our of the um, in our of our estimations, we basically we interact the the different agreements and uh, the um, investment promotion assistance status by the, by the agency, um, and we find that there are there are differences. Uh, typically, if I remember correctly, in the case of because we did it for trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties, and, and double taxation, 
for, for a double taxation, taxation, I think the impact was larger when there was a double taxation treaty. But I, I have to check because uh, we don't have it right now in the paper. But definitely is a um, relevant one. And, and they might interact because they are operating on a um, different source of cost. And if you are reducing two different costs, you might end up having larger impact. And, and that might be the case. And essentially, uh, that also holds for, for the other types of uh, agreements I referred to before. I, I think maybe it wasn't clear, but what I was specifically asking is whether um, there can be firm specific negotiated tax rates or tax breaks, um, not ah. something origin country times industry times year specific. Sure. The, what, what you have there in Costa Rica at the firm level, and so I, sorry about that, I under, understood that you referred to treaties. So basically is the free trade zones. Uh, you, can, uh, you can operate in, in the free trade zones in Costa Rica and, and that's firm specific. And, and there you receive a, a tax rebate uh, for a number of years and, and that, that's, that, that, that could play a role definitely. What we do in, in, in our estimation is just, since we have the census, so the actual census of firms in the free trade zone, we can remove them. And once you remove them, there is still, as I mentioned, a positive and significant impact of the investment promotion. Now, if you compare that estimated impact with the impact, including all firms, the impact of investment promotion uh, by itself is slightly smaller. So that means that that seems to be there seems to be some interaction. Uh, we uh, though don't examine explicitly the impact of the free trade zone regime by itself because it's, uh, it poses another uh, identification challenge in the sense that uh, firms are there, then they're already there. We don't know which firms didn't use it. So the, the safest way to control for that is just to remove them and to see what's, what's the impact of the investment promotion system by itself for those firms that are not using these tax breaks. Very cool, thanks. Okay, Leonardo uh, has a question. I, I want to follow up on the previous question and uh, want to ask on the, this information channel. Uh, would it be reasonable to, to, to assume that this information channel matters specifically for firms operating in certain sectors in activity? So for instance, more complex products or complex products where there is more um, intensity in relationship with the suppliers. Um, would that be a reasonable to assume and maybe worth testing to see the extent to which really it is um, um, uh, in the information channel? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's another good one. Um, yes, we, we have a similar idea. We, Tested, I didn't, I, I can show you even the results. Um, are, are, is the, the still on? So we, we did it for differentiated and not differentiated. And what you can see here is that there is a slightly larger impact on differentiated sectors. Uh, we don't believe it's significantly different though. Uh, but still, there might be better ways to define that and we are working on that because we believe that definitely that's indeed the case that for more complex operations requiring significantly more information the impact should be larger so that's a very crude approach to to measure this complexity and, and we see something in the direction but it's not so um strong yeah so we we are we are Keep, uh, we're keeping working on, 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 on having an, a better proxy for that. Okay, Louise Gillet, uh, she has a question. Um, so my question is, do, can you tell us a bit more about the information provision in itself? So I know that they organize forums and things like this. So is it about meeting cl potential clients or meeting potential suppliers? Or what is it exactly that the multinationals need to learn to, to make the, the decision. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Luis, for, for the question. Uh, they provide information on a lot of things. Um, let me see what I have here. Um, here are a few, few uh, testimonials from, from, the, from the firms uh, itself, uh, themselves. Uh, they, they, they gather information, they provide information on the 
how to what are the conditions to to open a firm what do you need to to do to do that what are the agents you need to contact you they provide information on for example how um, they have a very interesting uh, service which is uh, when you when you are a multinational firm and you want to establish your business in the country you have different costs and they compute those costs for you so basically tell you what would be the cost associated with operating in my country and that means the specific model you are interested in uh, like for example do i have providers or not uh, if um, do how can I reach my buyers? Are buyers in the country, are buyers abroad? If I need to import, how the process look like? If I need to export, how does the process look like? What are, what are the, the permits I need? Uh, are there incentives? So they don't provide incentives, seeing that doesn't, doesn't provide uh, fiscal incentives, but they provide information about those incentives. And, and, and here, um, uh, you have uh, some testimonials that you can look at. We, we, we got access to the surveys. Uh, these are surveys they conducted that were replied from almost 300 firms. And, and everybody praised the, the information services. And, and there are very specific uh, details they, they, they inform. And, and what I tell you is not only about what, what is interesting, it's not only about what they do, it's how they do it. It's quite impressive when you talk to them how professional these guards are. They're very professional. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, they are very enthusiastic. I mean, I, 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 they, I think they, they, the firm asks something and they will go even further to, to, to reply the information. That's our, our experience. I mean, it's just believe that when we submitted the, the request of the data, we submitted the, the, the request for our ideal database with the, with the expectation that we will only receive it the share of what we were requesting. And we got that and even more. And that's exactly the, the way when we discuss it with them is the way they reply. And, and we are working with them now, right now in a different project. And, and that's exactly the, how they operate. They are very professional. They provide very detailed, specific information on all these aspects. So even the tax rates and, and everything you can imagine to, to open a business. And, and they do in a very professional manner as um, Beata uh, has in, in her paper about handling the increase uh, from investors in a professional manner. They are, they are top on that. They are definitely top on that. Okay, great. We just finished uh, two minutes earlier than we were supposed to. Uh, Christian, thanks for joining us. Uh, it, 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 was, it was very useful and informative. Uh, on, although we are in a virtual environment, I would like to clap. Uh, uh, everyone, we have um, Jacqueline Platt from MIT joining us next Tuesday at 3 p.m. London time. So we hope to see you then. Uh, have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here.